Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this fifth Sunday after Pentecost presents us the teaching of Jesus in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5. This is Jesus speaking from the mountain, and uh, the discourse is about the justice of a Christian, which has to be more abundant than the justice of scribes and Pharisees. Let's hear what our Lord says. Accept your justice abound more than that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean then that our justice should be more abundant than that of the scribes and Pharisees? We need to listen to our Lord uh, Father because Jesus is giving some examples uh, taken from the law of Moses, one of the Ten Commandments. You have heard that it was said to them of old, thou shall not kill, and whoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, Moses said that, I say to you, this is a clear attestation of Jesus' divinity, Jesus speaking as God, the giver of the law, and he says, but I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment, not only by killing, but even by being angry at your brother, you shall be judged. And there are three levels now of being irritated against one of your brothers. In fact, Jesus immediately adds uh, on top of this uh, teaching, whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, we have here a Aramaic word which is not translated, can be translated in English in, uh, in a various manner. It is uh, fundamentally insult. Raka, if you do something, if you insult your brother, if you say to him foolish, stupid, crazy, so you shall be in danger of the council. And there is even a third level of uh, being, of sinning against charity, against fraternal charity, when you say, uh, Jesus says, whoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire, of the jenna, the eternal hell. So let's reflect on this first movement of this parable, of this teaching of our Lord. Jesus saying that our justice uh, has to be more abundant uh, than that of the scribes and the Pharisees. We should not concentrate ourselves only on the commandment as such, to be righteous, but we need to do more than justice. Justice is the presupposition, the very foundation of our being Christians, but it is the foundation. Justice needs to be completed by love, by charity, because God is love. And the very key teaching of the gospel is about love and forgiveness. It is then not sufficient not to, do, not to harm your brother by killing him. And we know that we can kill a person in several ways, but it is necessary not even insulting, being irritated with your brother. Now we can uh, see that the teaching here is about the necessity of fraternal charity to love our brothers and sisters in faith, and any person in need of mercy, in need of compassion, especially our enemies. So our Lord points to three folds against charity, 
moving from internal irritation when you, when you might be upset with a person, you might be angry at him, to manifesting total contempt. This is the reason why Jesus is escalating from saying you can be judged to even being condemned to the fire of hell. There are three levels of sin against charity in this gospel. And St. Augustine explains us these three levels of sin against charity. First, the lowest, feeling angry at your brother. This deserves the punishment of judgment. Then, second level, insulting the person. This deserves the punishment of the council. The council means the church. And the third level, when anger blinds us. And this uh, a kind of uh, hate against a person, and uh, this deserves the punishment of the hell of fire. This is why Jesus is speaking of this final punishment, the Jenna, the, the place where there is always fire burning, the hell. So, it is necessary to pay attention today to the importance of loving our brothers. But we should also clarify one thing when we speak of fraternal charity, when we speak of compassion and mercy towards our brethren. Nowadays, we run the risk of splitting Mercy, compassion, love from justice. We may misunderstand what Jesus is asking us to do in this gospel. We might easily end up saying that we need to love, we need to be merciful, but uh, by forgetting, in a way, the necessity of being righteous, of conforming our lives to the divine justice, even to the point of thinking that God is mercy and he forgets his justice. Jesus says, if your justice is not more abundant then that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of God. He's not saying, Jesus is not saying that we don't need any justice, but that our justice has to be exceeding the one of the Pharisees and scribes. So this means that justice is necessary, is the foundation, is the truth of compassion and love. So we need to know that justice needs to be fulfilled with love, needs to be completed, so to say, but it is the foundation. Otherwise, we might easily say, as unfortunately pe people do, uh, that we love God, we love our neighbor. We feel that sentiment of compassion, but we don't respect the Ten Commandments. For example, we don't go to Mass on Sunday, but we still love God. We still love our neighbor. Is that love true? Is that love a divine love? Or rather, my perception of love, my feeling, my sentiment of love, this to say that love without justice, without a clear foundation in God's law, is nothing. Love is a mere word. Uh, conversely, a justice without love, without mercy, without the necessity of forgiveness, of being compassionate, might easily become 
a way to be even more unjust and true and uh, to transform justice into a way to torture someone. We, we know that we all human beings need uh, compassion. We need that forgiveness. We know that without God's forgiveness and mercy, we cannot simply leave. And the best, of course, image of this complementarity of justice and love is God himself, who is the eternal being, eternal justice, giving everyone what he, she deserves, but same time being always ready to forgive, to give something more than what we really deserve, even something completely different from what we really deserve when we sin, when we uh, commit some evil against him. He gives us rather his love, his forgiveness. We cannot live without that love. But love is not empty. Love is not a simple sentiment and word but it is the truth of God, God's truth, God's inner life. So we uh, need to always look for this love, a love which is true, a truth which is compassionate, which is uh, forgiving uh, brethren. In this way, we can even more uh, understand the need of fraternal charity, of forgiving each other. As the first, the first letter of St. Peter, the epistle of this Mass, says, Dearly beloved, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, being lovers of the brotherhood, merciful, modest, humble, not rendering evil for evil, not railing for railing, but uh, contrarywise, blessing. For unto these are you called, that you may inherit a blessing. And this is the real blessing, to be one body, one uh, body in Christ, made one not because of our skill, because of our intelligence, and capacity, but because of Jesus' love. It is this love in truth that makes us one body in one church. Finally, one more consideration to come to a close. The very final part of this gospel needs also some attention. Jesus says, and this is the very, uh, very practical manifestation of this teaching about love and justice, justice and love. Jesus says, in a way which is surprising, when you come, he's speaking to the Jews, but this applies to us as well. When you come to Mass, when you are ready to offer your gift, and you come to the altar, and you remember that someone, one of your brothers or sisters, anyone in your family, in your relations, has something against you, leave there your offering, go back to that person, see that person, fix that situation, try to show compassion, to forgive, and then come back to offer your gift. When you do that, your gift is true. Your offering is accepted. Uh, this is something surprising because when we know that someone has something against us, we need to uh, do something. Not just waiting for the person to approach us or just thinking of many possible solutions, but doing something very practical. Go, see the person, try to speak to, to that person, forgive that person. You need to forgive a person who has something 
against you, has done something against you. This is the law of the gospel, forgiveness. This is the very characteristic of a Christian, to love, not because of our own skill, capacity. We would rather hate that person. We need to love because God has loved us. Christ has loved us. The context of this offering presented at the altar can easily be a holy mass. This is the offering par excellence, the Holy Eucharist. When you come to, to the Holy Mass, when you want to make your own offering in Jesus, the only acceptable offering to the Father, make sure that you have forgiven everyone, that you love in Jesus all your people, all your enemies, that you try to find a solution to reconcile people within your family. In that case, your offering is true. Your offering is brought up in, on the same altar of Christ and uh, given up by Christ to the Father as one offering with his sacrifice. This is also the reason why we Catholics go to confession before going to communion. This is clearly uh, taught by our Lord. If you remember there is, that there is something wrong, go to confession before approaching the altar of the Lord. If you are uh, aware of a mortal sin, you cannot receive Holy Communion. In the state of mortal sin, you would commit a sacrilege. Go first to be reconciled with your brethren, how? By being first reconciled with Christ in the sacrament of confession. Get the absolution and then come to offer your gift, your life. A contrite heart is the gift God is waiting from us to be offered. We ask our Lord to teach us how to be merciful, how to properly love as he loved us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.